get started. Uh, the topic for today is immunization and people with HIV. Again, this is a really um, you know big topic um, if we were to go kind of into the details of it, but I'm going to do kind of a brief, brief overview, and if you have questions on any part of it, I'm happy to kind of uh, answer those uh, uh, later on. Oh, I think I got the chat. Okay, uh, so let's go and get started. Um, I have no conflict of interest um, to disclose. Uh, and then this is supported. Um, this is a slide talking about the support, and then the views expressed do not necessarily reflect the official policies of the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, and any brand names uh, are mainly for the purpose of uh, training and identification only. Okay, so the learning objective for today is to summarize the ASIP and IH and CDC immunization guidelines for people with HIV. Uh, and what we're going to talk about um, is there's some uh, differences between the, the ACIP and the NIH CDC immunization guidelines, and it basically goes toward the, the data that's interpreted sort of differently by these public agencies. And so sometimes you'll see differences in the recommendations. And I'm kind of I'm gonna point out some of these differences, but just in case, depending on the resource that you're reviewing, you might get different guidance regarding the immunization schedule. So I uh, just keep that in mind depending on the resource that you look at for this. Uh, so this is kind of what I mentioned. So the NIH, the IDSA, the CDC recommendations um, align together but can differ from the ASIC recommendations. And these are the links to the two different sets of guidelines uh, for you to kind of review, um, but you may notice some of these changes. Okay, so, you know, talking about safety of vaccines uh, in persons living with HIV. So immunizations are generally safe, uh, except for live virus vaccines, especially in persons with low CD4 counts. Obviously the concern there is there can be replication and proliferation of live virus uh, in a setting where the patient is profoundly immunosuppressed and they talk about CD4 counts less than 200 or 15%. And so those would be contraindicated in that setting. Apart from that, uh, vaccines, multiple studies have shown to be safe and effective in persons with immunization. So that's kind of the counseling you're providing your patients. This is known to be safe and effective, um, thereby kind of, you know, recommending vaccination. Uh, and then the other concern is efficacy, right? So we have safety, we kind of talked about it, and then efficacy. So immunosuppression in patients with HIV, uh, you know, often may lead to suboptimal responses to the standard recommended vaccine doses. So by that, I mean, when you have a low CD4 count, um, you, your body may not mount an adequate response to the vaccine. Having said that, um, the guidance basically suggests that you can either wait till the immune reconstitute and the CD4 count goes above 200 to vaccinate, or you can still vaccinate if the risk is higher in that patient setting, right? So yes, it may not be as effective, but if the patient is at risk for those infections that you're trying to prevent, you may as well go ahead and vaccinate. And then there's recommendations of vaccinating again when the CD4 goes above 200 if you've not mounted an adequate response. So that's looking at safety and efficacy of vaccination and immunization in persons living with HIV. Okay, so this is the ASAP recommendation, uh, and y'all may be familiar with this format. It's a, it's a busy slide and a busy table, but I tried to highlight what we're looking at here in this black box. Uh, which talks about HIV infection and then the CD4 percentage. So I'm just going to, you know, mention these and then we'll go over some of these in detail. So we'll talk about COVID-19 vaccination and which is recommended for all patients with HIV. Uh, flu vaccine, again, only the inactivated influenza vaccines are recommended. Like we talked about, no live influenza vaccine is recommended for HIV. Uh, as you can see in the red bar, contraindicated. Uh, similar to that, the MMR, which is a live vaccine, is contraindicated for CD4 less than 200. And then the other one in the similar category of live vaccine is varicella. The other ones that we'll talk about are the Tdap or TD, the recombinant zoster vaccine, HPV. We'll go into details of the different types of pneumococcal vaccines that are available, hepatitis A, hepatitis B, meningococcal. Uh, and then just a mention for a meningococcal for CR group B. And pneumophilus influenza B, these are not recommended for HIV patients due to their HIV condition, but it is recommended for other indications, mainly asplenia and complement deficiency. So if you have that in a patient with HIV, you know, those vaccines are recommended. 
uh, but not so much because of the immunocompromising condition. Um, so this is kind of in a nutshell, kind of the vaccines that are recommended, and then I'll go briefly into details about each of these as we move forward. Uh, this is kind of looking at, you know, side by side, the NIH recommended vaccines and the ACEP. As you see, some of these kind of line up, but there are minor differences, which you may encounter. And I'm not going to go into the details of those uh, sort of during this talk, but just so that you can kind of view. And like I said, most of these kind of match up, but there might be some differences. Uh, kind of talked about live virus is kind of indicated, uh, live influenza for any CD4 count. And then we talked about it. C4 kind of less than 200 or uncontrolled HIV, replication, uh, high viral loads, MMR, varicella, uh, and then these are live attenuated typhoid and then yellow fever if it's related to um, travel. Okay, so moving on to the individual vaccines. Um, so meningococcal, so people with HIV and why do we do this? They have five to 24 fold high risk of developing invasive meningococcal disease. And what you're going to see is most of these are with the four strains that are available in the quadrivalent vaccine. So this one graph looks at the different proportions, and you're seeing common A, C, W, Y, and then there is a proportion of B, which is not included in the vaccine, but the guidance does not recommend it uh, for all persons with HIV. Um, so you have different types of quadrivalent vaccines available. Uh, we were familiar with Minactra, but that's no longer available. And then you have, um, you know, depending on the adjuvant that's used, the different types, and you know, any one of those would be applicable. Theories is two primary vaccination doses, eight weeks apart, and then the booster. Uh, next one is a recombinant zoster. Um, so the light zoster vaccine is no longer available in the U.S. So you really don't have to worry about that. Uh, whatever we have is mainly Shingrix, which is a recombinant zoster. Um, and it is now expanded to include individuals with HIV over the age of 18 to 19, depending on the guideline you refer to. And so this is a two-dose series uh, given two to six months apart. And so the new change here is all patients with HIV over the age of uh, 19 or 18 uh, are recommended to receive this vaccine. Okay, moving on to hepatitis A. Um, and so typically you want to test for immunity by getting antibodies before the va before vaccinating. And so if you look at the, the graph here, if there are persons without immunity, if your CD4 is greater than 200, you can give the HEPA vaccine series and then again, check for the antibody in one to two months. If your CD4 is less than 200, like I mentioned, if you are at risk for acquiring hepatitis A, go ahead and give the series. Uh, and if it's checked for immunity and if you still do not have positive antibody, you can revaccinate. If you don't have ongoing risk for acquiring hepatitis A, you can delay until your CD4 is greater than 200. Uh, and so these are the type of vaccines. You have the twin rigs as the combination which have A and B, and we'll get to that. Or you can use uh, these other preparations which only include hepatitis A. Okay, so moving on to hepatitis B. Um, and this is one that can be a little tricky as a lot of patients with HIV may not mount an adequate immune response. And I know this is a little uh, busy slide, but it kind of outlines the available preparation. So you can do the double dose, DD stands for double dose of Ingerix um, or Recombivax. The newer vaccine available is Heplosab, which has an adjuvant that actually increases the response uh, in antibody formation. And so that is what we are actually utilizing uh, in our clinics now, and that comes as a two-dose schedule, which is also easier for patients to complete. Uh, and then we talk about twin rigs, which has the HEP A and B, and that's the standard dose. So uh, either one of these regimens are recommended as an initial start to vaccinating for hepatitis B. Uh, and then basically you're checking for antibody one to two months after completing. And the number you're looking for is a titer of greater than now, what happens if you're a non-responder and your title is less than 10? In that case, you have these options. You can revaccinate with what you did originally, which is the double dose of Ingerix, Recombivax, or use Heplosat, or you can add an additional dose and do a four-dose series with the Ingerix and the Recombivax. So these are options uh, if you have someone who has not responded to your initial series. 
Okay, and then uh, briefly alluding to approach to, oops, if you have somebody only has a positive hep C core antibody, but is surface antigen and surface antibody negative, and that could mean that either it's a false positive uh, or they've had hepatitis B long ago uh, and that the antibodies have just waned or they have occult hepatitis. And this is what's recommended. You give one single dose of a hep B vaccine. You check the titers in one to two months, and then the number here is tenfold greater. So just to know, this is actually 100 and not the 10 that we looked at. If you're greater than 100 by that time, you're immune. If you're less than 100, you revaccinate with the whole series of hepatitis C. So this is a little different how you approach somebody with an isolated core antibody positive. Uh, pneumococcal vaccine, again, guidelines have changed for this one. And so just going to spend a few minutes on this. The available vaccines are your polysaccharide vaccine, the 23 valent, the PPSC 23. And then the conjugate vaccines, which previously was the PCV 13, now includes PCV 15 and PCV 20. So both the NIH uh, as well as the ACFCDC have updated their guidelines on utilizing the new vaccine, the conjugate varieties. And this here is, you know, kind of easy to follow flow charts depending on where your patient fits. The goal is um, to sort of level the playing field and everybody kind of moves over to the conjugate vaccine schedule. Um, and PCV20 is kind of re what's recommended, but if you go deeper into the actual studies, the PCV20 had fewer as a HIV patients in those initial studies as opposed to the PCV15. So uh, it's possible that you, know, you may want to use PCV15 and then you have to follow it up with the polysaccharide vaccine. Okay, so looking at the top graph here, uh, if you have someone who's never had a pneumococcal vaccine, you start off with the 15 or 20. If you give someone the 20, you do not have to follow it up with the uh, polysaccharide. So if you do the 15, eight weeks after you get the PCSC 23. More commonly, our patients have received PCV 13 but have not completed the schedule. In that case, you can give a PCV 20 after a year and that completes the series or you can continue with the PPSC 23 eight weeks after and then two doses five years apart. And that's the old schedule, which is still sort of recommended if you wanted to follow that. I uh, you know, our kind of opinion is, you know, you can give the PC 20 and be and complete that schedule and not have to revaccinate multiple times, which has its own challenges. Uh, these are other kind of combinations. If you've had somebody that has had the PCV 13 and one dose of the PPSC 23, Similar to the previous, you can give a PCV20 and complete the series there, or you can keep the old schedule. Uh, and similarly, if someone has had PPSV23 but has not had the conjugate vaccine, you want to give them the conjugate vaccine. Um, and you can either do that with a PCV20 or give another dose of PPSV23 five years out and then do the conjugate. But you definitely do want to give conjugate. Uh, one of the questions is if you have not done so, okay, in the immunization. Okay. So it's a little kind of, you know, complicated still for the pneumococcal vaccines, but the general idea is the newer conjugate vaccines are more immunogenic. And if your patients haven't received it, uh, that's one that you do want to get them to, to complete the series with. Influenza. Um, so the quadrivalent live attenuated influenza vaccine is not recommended like we talked about. Um, if you're less than 60, if your patient is less than 65, they get the inactivated influenza virus or the recombinant for those with egg allergy. And then if you're greater than 65, you want to give the higher dose vaccine or use the new adjuvant because that is more immunogenic in older individuals. Uh, TD and Tdap, uh, one-time dose of Tdap after the age of 11 years, uh, which is you know, similar to patient, people living without HIV followed by either a TD or TDAP booster every 10 years, uh, which has not changed. In women, um, women get one dose every pregnancy of TDAP between 27 to 36 weeks of gestation. So no changes in that one. Uh, HPV vaccine. So uh, immunocompromising conditions, which includes HIV, recombinant nine-valent HPV vaccine, which is a three-dose series, is recommended regardless of age of the initial vaccine. So you know, the nine valent includes the seven serotypes that are most relevant in causing cancer and malignancy, but also the two um, 
types, that is the 6 and 11, that result in genital warts. Uh, and so 0, 1, 2, and 6 months, uh, if you miss a dose, um, you don't have to restart the series. And then I know this question does come up. Um, although routine vaccination is not recommended for persons age 27 to 45, there is some literature that suggests people with HIV may benefit from vaccination in this age, and there's shared clinical decision-making between the provider and the patient is recommended in situations. Uh, this does come up often in our clinic, um, and so we do discuss with patients that, you know, in that age group that although not routinely recommended, it may have some benefit in preventing malignancy um, and, and later on, and so uh, we do offer this. Uh, COVID-19, so what are the current recommendations? So recommended to complete the primary series, which is the three doses of the initial monovalent uh, mRNA, Moderna, Pfizer, BioNTech vaccine, uh, followed by one dose of the bivalent mRNA vaccine. And then the most recent recommendation is a second dose of the bivalent vaccine, at least two months following the last one, um, for those with moderate to severe immunocompromising conditions, which include untreated HIV or HIV with a CD4 count less than 200. So the second bivalent vaccine booster is now recommended um, for, for this patient population. I did want to just allude to MPOX immunization. Um, as you all know, we are currently in the midst of an uh, epidemic of MPOX. And so it is recommended uh, the Genius vaccine um, for patients who are receiving PrEP or PEP within 14 days of suspected exposure to a possible case of MPOX. And then there's other indications. Uh, and so um, HIV is on there. And then so are these other kind of uh, category. So if you have any patient with HIV, please offer the impact vaccine. It's a two-dose regimen. Uh, and then we are offering it intramuscular or one-fifth of the dose subcutaneous uh, administered 28 days apart. Uh, so in summary, a live vaccine should be avoided with low CD4 counts. People with HIV have different recommendations, so be mindful of that. The chart from ACIP is a useful one to have handy. Uh, and then this is a question that patients often ask. Multiple vaccines can be given at the same time with no regard for, except for the, the live vaccine. Uh, these are my resources. 